What's up, everybody? Uh, HW here again with uh, chapter 11. You can see by the background that I am not at home. I rode my bike into work. And by bike, I mean motorcycle. Um, using the Wi Fi, I'm doing a little volunteer shift here this morning. So I thought I'd get here a little early and uh, read a chapter, get it uploaded using the uh, Ferrari Wi Fi that this school has when nobody is here using it. Pretty slow when you have a thousand kids uh, on a thousand devices uh, <clears throat> chewing up the bandwidth, but uh, when there's one dude in the entire building, it's, it goes pretty quick. All right, uh, it's not a thousand. There's what, like 400 kids on any given day? And anyway, all right, chapter 11. Uh, here we go. We just had that, um, well, that scandal, right? I mean, the scandalous scene. Um, it, it blew everybody away. And uh, let's see what the uh, what, what how everything picks up. Chapter 11. After the scene in the fertilizing room, all upper caste London was wild to see this delicious creature who had fallen on his knees before the director of hatcheries and conditioning, or rather, the ex-director, for the poor man had resigned immediately afterwards and never set foot inside the center again. I'd flopped down and called him. The joke was almost too good to be true. My father. Linda, on the contrary, cut no ice. Nobody had the smallest desire to see Linda. To say one was a mother, that was a past... That was past a joke. It was an obscenity. Moreover, she wasn't a real savage. Had been hatched out of a bottle and conditioned like anyone else. She couldn't have really quaint ideas. Finally, and this was by far the strongest reason for people not wanting to see poor Linda, what was her appearance? Fat, having lost her youth, with bad teeth, a blocked complexion, and that figure forward. You simply couldn't look at her without feeling sick. Yes, positively sick. So the best people were quite determined not to see Linda. Linda, for her part, had no desire to see them. The return to civilization was, for her, the return to Soma. It was the possibility of lying in bed and taking a holiday after holiday, without ever having come back to a headache or a fit of vomiting, without ever having or being made to feel as though you always felt as a tail, and as though you'd done something so shamefully antisocial that you could never hold your head up again. Soma played none of these unpleasant tricks. The holiday it gave was perfect, and if the morning after was disagreeable, it was, not, it was so not intrinsically, but only by comparison with the joys of the holiday. The remedy was to make the holiday continuous. Greedily, she clamored for ever larger, ever more frequent doses. Dr. Shaw at first demurred, then let her have what she wanted. She took as much as 20 grams a day. We shall finish her off in a month or two, the doctor confided to Bernard. One day to the respiratory center, we'll be paralyzed. No more breathing. Finished. A good thing, too. We could rejuvenate, of course, we're different, but we can't. Surprisingly, as everyone thought for on Soma holiday, Linda was most conveniently out of the way. John raised his eyebrows. But aren't you shortening her life? But have I given her so much? In one sense, yes, Dr. Shaw admitted, but in another, we're actually lengthening it. The young man stared uncomprehending. Soma may make you lose a few years in time, the doctor went on, but think of the enormous immeasurable duration it can give, out, give you out of time. Every Soma holiday is a bit of what our ancestors used to call eternity. John began to understand. Eternity was in our lips and our and eyes, he murmured. Eh? Nothing. Of course, Dr. Shaw went on. You can't allow people to go popping off into eternity if they've got any serious work to do, but she hasn't got any serious work to do. All the same, John persisted. I don't believe it's right. The doctor shrugged his shoulders. Well, of course, keep her ever screaming mad all the time. In the end, John was forced to give in. Linda got her soma. Thenceforward, she remained in her little room on the 37th floor of Bernard's apartment house, in bed, with the radio and television always on, and the patchouli dip tap just dripping, and the soma tablets within reach of her hand. There she remained, and yet wasn't there at all. It was all the time away, infinitely far away on holiday, on holiday in some other world, where the music on the radio was a labyrinth of sonorous colors, a sliding, palpitating labyrinth that led, by what beautifully inevitable windings, to a bright center of absolute conviction. The dancing images of the television box or the performers in some indescribably delicious all-singing theater, where the dripping patchouli was more than scent, was the sun, was a million saxophones, was Hokufei making love, and much more so, incomparably more, and without end. Well, we can't rejuvenate, but I'm very glad, Dr. Shaw. I concluded to have had this opportunity to see an example of senility in a human being. Thank you so much for calling me in. He shook Bernard warmly by the hand. 
It was John, then, that they were after, and as it was only the, through Bernard, his accredited guardian, that John could be seen, Bernard now found himself, for the first time in his life, treated not merely normally, but as a person of outstanding importance. There was no more talk of alcohol in his blood, sur blood surrogate, no jibes at his personal experience. Henry Foster went out of his way to be friendly. The needle Hoover made him a present of six packets of sex hormone chewing gum. The assistant predestinator came out and cadged almost abjectly, abjectly for an invitation to one of Bernard's evening parties. As for the women, Bernard had only to hint at the possibility of an invitation, and he could have whichever of them he liked. Bernard's asked me to meet the savage next Wednesday, Danny announced triumphantly. I'm so glad, said Lanier. And now you must admit that you were wrong about Bernard. Don't you think he's really rather sweet? Danny nodded. And I must say, I was quite agreeably surprised. Hugh Fotler, the director of predestination, three deputy assistant fertilizer generals, the professor of Healy's in the College of Emotional Engineering, the dean of the Westminster Community Singery, the supervisor of Volkanovsky Education, the list of Bernard's notabilities was interminable. Interminable, sorry. And I had six girls last week, he confided to Hemholtz Watson. One on Monday, two on Tuesday, two more on Friday, and one on Saturday. And if I'd had the time or the inclination, there were at least a dozen more who be only be too anxious. Hemmels listened to his boastings in a silence so gloomily disapproving that Bernard was offended. You're envious, he said. Hemmels shook his head. That's rather sad, as all, he answered. Bernard went on, went off in a huff. Never, he told himself, never would he speak to Hemmels again. So there, nah. All right, we're a little baby. Sorry, I'm editorializing. I take it back. The days passed. Success went fizzily to Bernard's head, and in the process completely reconciled him, as any good intoxicant should do, to a world which, up till then, had, he had found very unsatisfactory. In so far as it recognized him as important, the order of things was good, but reconciled for his success, he yet refused to forego the privilege of criticizing this order. For the act of criticizing heightened his sense of importance, made him feel larger. Moreover, he did a. Moreover, he did genuinely believe that there were things to criticize. At the same time, he generally liked being a success and having all the girls he wanted. For those who now, for the sake of the savage, paid their court to him, Bernard would parade a carping unorthodoxy. He was politely listened to, but behind his back, people shook their heads. That young man will come to a bad end, they said, prophesying the more confidently in that they themselves would in due course personally see to it that the end was bad. He won't find another savage to help him out of this second time, they said. Meanwhile, however, there was a, the first savage. They were polite. And because they were polite, Bernard felt positively gigantic. Gigantic and at the same time light with elation. Lighter than air. Lighter than air, said Bernard, pointing upwards. Like a pearl in the sky, high, high above them, the weather department's cap the balloon shone rosily in the sunshine. The said savage, so ran Bernard's instructions, to be shown civilized life in all its aspects. He was being shown a bird's eye view of it at present, a bird's eye view from the platform of the Charing Tea Tower. The station master and the resident meteorologist were acting as guides, but it was Bernard who did most of the talking. Intoxicated, he was behaving as though, at the very least, he were a visiting world controller, lighter than air. The Bombay green rocket dropped out of the sky. The passengers alighted. Eight identical Dravidian twins in khaki looked out of the eight portholes of the cabin. The stewards. 1,250 kilometers an hour, said the station master impressively. What do you think of that, Mr. Savage? John thought it very nice. Still, he said, Ariel can put a girdle around the earth in 40 minutes. The savage, wrote Bernard in his report to Mustafa Mond, shows surprisingly little astonishment at, or awe of, civilized in inventions. This is partly due, no doubt, to the fact that he has heard them talked about by the woman, Linda, his m dash dash dash. And that is a signal that uh, he didn't actually spell it out. There was a, an M and a, a line through it, so he didn't finish it. It's like a little stars or asterisks that we do now, like, you know, S, asterisk, 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 asterisk. okay. Mustafa Mond frowned. Does the fool think I'm too squeamish to see the word written out at full length? Partly on his interest being focused on what he calls the soul, which he persists in regarding as an entity independent of the physical environment, whereas I tried to point it out to him. The controller skipped the next sentences and was just about to turn the page in search of something more interesting or concrete when his eye was caught by a series of quite extraordinary phrases. Though I must admit, he read, that I agree with the savage in finding civilized infantility too easy, or, as he puts it, to not, not expensive enough. 
and I would like to take this opportunity of drawing your lordship's attention to... Mustafa Mon's anger gave place almost at once to mirth. The idea of this creature solemnly lecturing him, him about the social order was really too grotesque. The man must have gone mad. I have to give him a lesson, he said to himself. Then he threw back his head and laughed aloud. For the moment, at any rate, the lesson would not be given. It was a small factory of lighting sets for helicopters, a branch of the Electrical Equipment Corporation. They were met on the roof. They were met on the roof itself, for that circular letter of recommendation from the controller was magical in its effects by the chief technician and the human element manager. They walked downstairs into the factory. The process, explained the human element manager, were carried out so far as possible by a single Balkanovsky group. And in effect, 83 almost noseless black brachycephalic deltas were cold pressing. The 56 four spindle chucking and turning machines were being manipulated by 56 aquiline and ginger gammas. 107 heat conditioned epsilon Senegalese were working in the foundry. 33 delta females, long headed, sandy with narrow pelvises, and all with 20 millimeters of 1 meter 69 centimeters tall, were cutting screws. In the assembling room, the dynamos were being put together by two sets of gamma plus dwarfs. The two low work tables faced one another. Between them crawled the conveyor with its load of separate parts. 47 blonde heads were confronted by 47 brown ones. 47 snubs by 47 hooks. 47 reseeding by 47 prognathous chins. The completed mechanisms were inspected by 18 identical curly auburn girls in gamma green, packed in crates by 34 short-legged, left-handed male delta minuses, and loaded into the waiting trucks and lorries by 63 blue-eyed, flaxen, and freckled epsilon semi-morons. Oh, brave new world. By some malice of his memory, the savage found himself repeating Miranda's words. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. And at that point, you start hearing something a little bit different in that in that same phrase, right? Earlier in the novel, he was like, it was awe, right? Oh my gosh, I can't believe what... What kind of a crazy world is this with such people that live in it? And now it's like it, it has a different tone to it, right? It's, it's a little it's taken on a, a different, uh, different meaning, I think. And I assure you, the human element manager concluded as they left the factory, we hardly ever have any trouble with our workers. We're always fine. But the savage had suddenly broke away from his companions and was violently retching behind a clump of laurels, as though the solid earth had been a helicopter in an air pocket. The savage, wrote Bernard, refuses to take Soma, and seems much distressed because of the woman Linda, his mm, mm, remain permanently on holiday. It is worthy of a note that, in spite of his mm, senility and the extreme repulsiveness of her appearance, the savage frequently goes to see her and appears to be much attached to her. An interesting example of the way in which early conditioning can be made to modify and even run counter to natural impulses. In this case, the impulse to recoil from an unpleasant object. <laughs> and, the, yeah, there we go, right? We see people as objects. An unpleasant object. It's a Linda. It's a, it's a person, uh, not an object. But whatever. It's a brave new world. At Eton, they alighted on the roof of Upper School. On the opposite side of the schoolyard, the 52 stories of Lupton's Tower gleamed white in the sunshine. The college on their left and on their right, the school community singery reared their venerable tiles of ferro concrete and vita glass. In the center of the quadrangle stood the quaint old chrome seal statue of our board. Dr. Gaffney, the provost, and Miss Deep, the headmistress, received them as they stepped out of the plane. There's a little cringy part in here. Um, Bernard is uh, flirtatious in a physical way, so I'm going to maybe gloss over some of those details. Do you have many twins here? The savage asked rather apprehensively as they set out on the tour of their inspection. Oh, no. Probably not. Eaton is reserved exclusively for upper caste boys and girls. One egg, one adult. Makes education more difficult, of course, but as they'll be called upon to take responsibilities and deal with unexpected emergencies, it can't be helped. He said. Bernard, meanwhile, had taken a strong fancy to Miss Teeth. If you're free Monday, Wednesday, or Friday evening, he was saying, jerking his thumb toward the savage. He's curious, you know, Bernard added. Quaint. Miss Teeth smiled, and her smile was really charming, he thought. But thank you. He'd be delighted to come to one of his parties. The provost opened the door. Five minutes. Five minutes in, that alpha double plus classroom left John a trifle bewildered. What is elementary relativity? He whispered to Bernard. I tried to explain, then thought better of it and suggested that they should go to some other classroom. From behind a door to, in the corridor leading to the beta minus geography room, a ringing soprano voice called one, two, three, four, and then with 
he re impatience as you were. Now, things you can drill, exclaimed the headmistress. Most of our girls are free martins, of course. I'm a free martin myself. She smiled at Bernard. We have about 800 unsterilized ones who need constant drilling. In the beta minus geography room, John learnt that a savage reservation is a place which, owing to unfavorable climatic or geological conditions, and poverty or natural resources has not been worth the expense of civilizing. Click. The room was darkened, and suddenly on the screen above the master's head there were the penitentes of Acoma, prostrating themselves before Our Lady and wailing as John had heard them wail, confessing their sins before Jesus on the cross, before the eagle image of Luzon. The young Etonians fairly shouted with laughter. Still wailing, the penitentes rose to their feet, stripped off their outer garments, and with knotted whips began to beat themselves blow after blow. Redoubled, the laughter drowned even the amplified record, record of their groans. Why do they laugh? asked the savage in pained bewilderment. Why? Provost turned toward him, still broadly grinning. Towards him, a still broadly grinning face. Why? <laughs> because it's so extraordinarily funny. In the, cinemat in the cinematographic twilight, Bernard risked a gesture which, in the past, even total darkness would have hardly would hardly have emboldened him to make. Uh, he put his arm around the headmistress's waist and then uh, snatched a kiss. Perhaps we'd better go on, said Miss Heat, and was ordered to the door. And this, said the provost a moment later, is hypnopathic control room. Hundreds of synthetic music boxes, one for each dormitory, stood ranged in shelves around three sides of the room, pigeonholed on fourth were the paper soundtrack rolls on which the various hypnopathic lessons were printed. And again, it's funny, it's analog, right? This is, it's all analog, but it's all futuristic. So uh, one of those anachronisms, right? This paint, like, what, it's on paper? It's not digital? Come on, come on, Huxley. Get with the future. You slipped the roll in here, exclaimed Bernard, interrupting Dr. Gavin. Press down the switch. No, no, that, not that one. Corrected the provost, annoyed. That one, then. Roll unwind. The selenium cells transform the light impulses into sound waves, and, and there you are. Do they read Shakespeare? Asked the savage as they walked on their way through the biochemical laboratory past the school library. Certainly not, said the headmistress, well, blushing. Our library, said Dr. Gaffney, consists, well, contains only books of reference. Our young people need a distraction, they can get it at the tea leaves. We don't encourage them to indulge in any solitary amusements. Five busloads of boys and girls singing or in a silent embracement rolled past them over the vitrified highway. Just returned, explained Dr. Gaffney. While Bernard, whispering, made an appointment with the headmistress for that evening. In the slew chromaturum, death conditioning begins at 18 months. Every tot spends two mornings a week at the hospital for the dying. And the best toys are kept there, and they get chocolate cream on death days. They learn to take dying as a matter of course. Like any other phys physiological process, put in the headmistress professionally. It's 8 o'clock at the Savoy. This is all arranged. Savoir. That is Savoir. Maybe Savoir? The boy? Ah. On their way back to London, they stopped at Television Corporation's factory at Brentford. Do you mind waiting here a moment while I go and telephone? asked Bernard. The savage waited and watched. The main day shift was going off duty. Crowds of lower caste workers were queued up in front of the monorail sta station. Seven or eight hundred gamma, delta, and epsilon men and women, with not more than a dozen faces and stature between them. To each of them, with his or her ticket, the booking clerk pushed over a little cardboard control box. The long caterpillar of men and women. Move slowly forward. What's in those? Remembering the merchant of linens. Those caskets? The savage inquired when Bernard rejoined him. Well, the day's soma ration, Bernard answered rather indistinctly, for he was mastic masticating a piece of bent Benito Hoover's chewing gum. They get it after the work's over. Four half gram tablets, six on Saturdays. He took John's arm affectionately, and they walked back to the helicopter. And Annie came singing into the changing room. You seem very pleased with yourself, said Annie. I am pleased, she answered. Zip. Bernard rang up a half hour ago. Zip. She stepped out of her shorts. He has an unexpected engagement. Zip. Asked me if I'd take the savage to the tea leaves this evening. I must fly. She hurried away towards the bathroom. She's a lucky girl, Fanny said to herself as she watched Lenina go. There was no envy in the comment. Good-natured Fanny was merely stating a fact. Lenina was lucky. Lucky in having shared with Bernard a generous portion of the savage's immense celebrity. Lucky in reflecting from her insignificant person a moment's supremely fashionable glory. 
Had not the secretary of the Young Women's Fordian Association asked her to give a lecture about her experiences? Had she not been invited to the annual dinner of the Aphroditeum Club? Had she not already appeared in the Feelytone News, visibly, audibly, and tactfully appeared to countless millions all over the planet? Hardly less flattering than had been the attentions paid to her by conspicuous individuals. The resident world controller's second secretary had asked her to dinner and breakfast. She had spent one weekend with the Ford Chief Justice and another with the Arch Community Songster of Canterbury. The president of the Internal and External Secretions Corporation was, per was perpetually on the phone, and she had been to Deauville with the gov deputy governor of the Bank of Europe. It was wonderful, of course, and yet in a way, she confessed to Fanny, I feel as though I were getting something on false pretenses. But of course, the first thing they all want to know is what it's like to make love to a savage, and I have to say I don't know. She shook her head. Most of them don't believe me, of course, but it's true. I wish it weren't. She checked sadly and sighed. He's terribly good looking, don't you think so? But doesn't he like you? asked Annie. Sometimes I think he does, and sometimes I think he doesn't. He always does his best to avoid me. He goes out of the room when I come in. He won't touch me. He won't even look at me. But sometimes, if I turn around suddenly, I catch him staring. And then, well, you know how men look when they look. You know how men look when they like you. Yes, Fanny knew. I can't make it out, said Romeo. She couldn't make it out, and not only was bewildered, but also rather upset. Because you see, Fanny, I like him. Liked him more and more. Well, now there'd be a real chance, she said, she thought, as she scented herself after the bath. Dab, 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 a real chance. Her high spirits overflowed in song. Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in coma. Hug me, honey. Snuggly bunny, loves as good as Soma. The scent organ was playing a delightfully refreshing herbal cappuccio, rippling ar arpeggios of thyme and lavender of rosemary, basil, myrtle, tarragon, a series of daring modulations through the spice keys into amber free, and a slow return through sandalwood, camphor, cedar, and uh, new mown hay, with occasional subtle touches of discord, a whiff of kidney pudding, the faintest suspicion of pig dung. Back to the simple aromatics which was with which the piece began. The final blast of time died away. It was a round of applause. The lights went up and the synthetic music machine, the soundtrack roll began to unwind. It was a trio for hyperviolin, super cello, and oboe surrogate that now filled the air with agreeable languor. Thirty or forty bars, and then, against this instrumental background, a much more than human voice began to warble. Now throaty, now from the head, now hollow as a feet as a flute, now charged with yearning harmonics. It effortlessly passed from Gaspard Forster, Forster's low record on the very frontiers of musical tone to a trilled bat note high above the highest C, to which in 1770 with the Ducal Opera of Arma, and to the astonishment of Mozart, Lucre Lucrezia Ajugari, alone of the, the singers in history, once piercingly gave utterance. Sunk in their pneumatic stalls, Lenina and the savage Snit listened. It was now the turn. It was now the turn also for the eyes and sin. The house lights went down. The fiery letters stood out solid as and as though self-supporting, supported in the darkness. Three weeks in a helicopter, an all super singing, synthetic talking, colored stereoscopic feely with synchronized scent organ accompaniment. Take hold of those metal knobs on the arms of your chair, whispered Lenina. Otherwise, you won't get any of the feely effects. The savage did as he was told. Those fiery letters, meanwhile, had disappeared. And there were ten seconds of complete darkness, then suddenly dazzling and incomparably more solid-looking than they would have seemed in actual flesh and blood, far more real than reality, there stood the stereoscopic images locked in one another's arms of a gigantic negro and a golden-haired young brachycephalic beta-plus female. The savage started. A sensation in his lips. He looked at the hand he held. The situation had ceased. As his hand fell back on the metal knob, it began again. The scent organ, meanwhile, breathed pure musk, firing a soundtrack, super dove, cooed. And so at this point, uh, they watch this movie. Uh, they experience the movie, right? So you get your hands on the on the, the brass knobs there, and then that, that I guess, what uh, sends the sense into your brain, and, and you, you kind of you feel everything that you're seeing, right? Uh, it's, I don't necessarily need to read this. You guys can read it if you want to. Um, it's There's no plot. <laughs> uh, the guy, like, kidnaps the girl, and then is taking over and there's lots of sex and craziness. So I'm just going to skip to that. You can read it if you want to. So afterwards, here's, uh, here's how it goes. Uh, he was obscurely terrified lest she, sh she should cease to be something he could feel himself unworthy of. Wow. 
I don't think you ought to see things like that, he said, making haste to transfer from Lenina herself to the surrounding circumstances the blame for any past or possible future lapse from perfection. Things like what, John? Like this horrible film. Horrible? Lenina was generally astonished, but I thought it was lovely. It was base, he said indignantly. It was noble. She shook her head. I don't know what you mean. How was he so clear? Why did he go out of his way to soil things? In the taxi car, he hardly even looked at her, bound by strong vows that had never been pronounced obedient to laws that had long since ceased to run. He sat averted and in silence, sometimes as though a finger had plucked at some almost breaking string. His whole body would shake with a sudden nervous start. The taxi copter landed on the roof of Lenina's apartment house. At last, she thought exultingly as she stepped into the cab. At last, even though he had been so queer just now. Standing on her lamp, she peered into her hand mirror. At last. Yes, her nose was a bit shiny. She shook the loose powder from her puff. While he was paying off a taxi, there would be just the time. There would just be time. She rubbed at the shininess, thinking he's terribly good looking. No need for him to be shy like Bernard. And yet, any other man would have done it long ago. Well, now at last. That fragment of face in the little round mirror suddenly smiled at her. Good night, said a strangled voice behind her. And in a wheeled round, he was standing in the doorway of the cab, his eyes fixed, staring. He had evidently been staring all this time while she was powdering her nose, waiting, for, but for what? Or hesitating, trying to make up his mind, and all the time thinking, thinking. She could not imagine what extraordinary thought. Good night, Lenina, he repeated and made a strange grimacing attempt to smile. But, John, I, th I thought you were, I mean, aren't you? He shut the door and bent forward to say something at the kid's driver. The cab shot up in the air. Looking down through the window and the floor, the savage could see Lenina's upturned face, hale in the bluish light of the lamps. The mouth was open. She was calling. A foreshortened figure rushed away from him. The diminishing square of the roof seemed to be falling through the darkness. Five minutes later, he was back in his room. From its hiding place, he took out his mouse-nibbled volume, turned with religious care its stained and tumbled pages, and began to read Othello. Othello, he remembered, was like a hero of three weeks in a helicopter. Blackness. Drying her eyes, Lenina walked across the roof to the lift. On her way down to the 27th floor, she pulled out her Soma bottle. One gram, she decided, would not be enough. Hers had been more than a one-gram affliction. But if she took two grams, she ran the risk of not waking up in time tomorrow morning. She compromised. And in the word le cup left palm, shook out three half-gram tablets. All right, everybody. See you next time.